So here we are in a new year, and our theme this year is about reinvigorating trust. And so today I'd like to talk about how we can get the boost. Why is it that this incredible quality called trust can be such an amazing boost to us, to our nervous system, to our internal circuitry? I want to share some of that and uh, give us an opportunity to think about it and to go forward into 2015 with a sense of, yes, I can do this. Do you know, there are things in life which I see as being the keys to living happily, to living successfully, to living positively, and to living prosperously. But somehow, the way in which we live our world, maybe it's in, in our world, maybe it's something to do with the general climate and culture of being British, has such a despondent, squashing kind of uh, way about it. It doesn't have to be like that. You don't have to live the way other people tell you. Just because people say, oh, we don't do things like that around here, we're British. Well, fine. If British means being unhappy and, and, and not, not being able to rise above, well, dispense with that notion of Britishness. Say maybe we need to recreate it. One of the great things about being in Britain is that we are a really tolerant society most of the time. One of the problems about that, the flip side, is that we tend to always live our life, lives flatlining. Well, again, I say, you know, if, if that's the way people want to live, if they want to live flatlining, live flatlining. But if you want to make something more of your life, if you want to say, Do you know, I've, I don't know how long I've got in my life, but I want to make something of it. I want to know that it counted for something. I'd like to improve the, the quality of my inner well-being. Yeah, I may not be the, the, the most well person, but can I be better inside? Can I face each day with a sense of, you know, I'm going to make something of this? So there are these keys, and that is what we try and share with you. We want an organization that is not just about people who come in, clock in, take their money, clock out, and go home. We want to be an organization, a business where instead of it being a Monday to Friday kind of dying, which it is in so many places where people work in Britain, it's a place where people rejoice, they celebrate, they think this is great. Life is for the living. And trust is one of those keys. The three points I'd like to share with you very briefly in this talk. One is about what trust used to mean. The second is about what trust, why trust matters today. And thirdly, well, if we're going to take action, what should we do? How should we act? What did trust used to mean? Uh, what is it when we think about it? Well, first of all, here is a, a working, helpful definition of trust. It's firm belief in the reliability, the truth, or the ability of someone or something. And words that come to mind when we think about trust include confidence, belief, faith, freedom, from suspicion, uh, doubt, sureness, that's freedom from suspicion or doubt, sureness, certainty, assurance, conviction, reliance. You, can, you may be think, able to think of a few more. When we think about what trust used to mean, here are some images that come to mind. What's the one on the furthest left? Who is this? It's Dixon of Doc Green. Some of you are wanting to pretend you weren't old enough, but I know exactly your dates of birth. Don't you know that? How many of you remember who Jack, War Jack Warren and Dixon of Doc Green were? Let me see your hands, please. Thank you. Some of you do. And some of you are saying, what on earth is he talking about now? Anyway, Dixon of Doc Green represented something of assurance and trust. <laughs> I just realized you're here, the constabulary here. You know who we're talking about, don't you, Dick? Um, and this, there was a time when... Without a doubt, if you saw a police officer, the idea of distrust never, never, ever arose in your mind. If you were a small boy growing in London like me, you hoped you never ever saw a police officer because you only ever saw them when there was trouble. And the people we feared the most were the park keepers. I've told you that before. Park keepers in parks. Do you remember this, John? Do you, you were probably a very well-behaved small boy. Um, that's why you're the Deputy Chief uh, Lord Lieutenant now. See, the, the thing is, but police officers represented that sense of authority and respect, reliability, and trust. 
teachers too. Now, you may not have liked your teachers. How many of you didn't like some of your teachers? Anyone have a favorite teacher? Who had a favorite teacher? And who had a teacher you really didn't like? A few of you. They're not around. Don't worry. I'm not going to tell them. But teachers too, whether we liked them or not, they represented figures that we could trust. Now, I'm not making a comment here about how things have swung. I'm just saying that's, that's how we see trust in the past. And our homes were generally secure places. Does anyone here have an experience where, where you lived, you didn't lock the front door? Any, any room? Yes. And that, can I just see a few more hands? Yeah, there we go. Uh, uh, that may seem, thank you very much. Please put your hands down. That may seem really strange. Is that really strange, Katie? Lock, not lock your, you can't imagine it, can't you? No. But that was the world that we live in. And we're not talking about the medieval times, by the way. You know, these people aren't that old. Um, nowadays, we leave our homes and we lock the back door, we lock the windows, we lock the cupboards, we lock the front door, and uh, unlock our cars. Lock them. It's, that's the world we've got into. But it, there was a different way of living. And, of course, family doctors were... Um, Highly respected, highly trusted people. It's interesting, today's the day when they talk about Harold Shipman. Um, but they represented that. And what about household appliances? You did not buy a household appliance in, in, with any idea that it was ever going to stop, actually. And many of you may, some of you may have bought um, vacuum cleaners with the famous Hoover name or any others. Um, I mean, the first, first washing machine we had was a second second-hand washing machine made by that company and it still went on and we sold it. Uh, nowadays you buy something and five minutes later you're going back to your five-year warranty which you've bought at great cost, probably more expensive than the appliance itself. And there was a time when you could buy used cars and uh, there was a reasonable degree of trustworthiness and now every used car salesman is tarred with this particular brand and image. So trust used to mean that. And, of course, trust also uh, carried over to some degree into the world of politics. Nowadays, surveys tell us that teachers and doctors, doctors particularly, may be trusted at the level of about 70% of the population feel that. Uh, local politicians, about 20%. Uh, national politicians, parliamentarians, about 25%. That's the level of trust that people in the general population express in their politicians. What has happened? What, what is it about the way in which our world has changed that the people who govern us, either locally or nationally, are so utterly distrusted? Some of them are really good people. They're genuine, some. But what is it about the, the pattern of their behavior and the way in which they do things, the way they answer questions or, more properly, don't answer questions or shout at each other across the floor of the House of Commons? Can you imagine that window to the world? Britain, Britain is seen representing the parent of democracy and people act as small children and shout across the floor at each other. Extraordinary. And then we expect our children to be different. There was a time when journalists probably were trusted people as well. Now, of course, who knows? Who knows whether what they're doing is honest or not? Who knows whether they're telling you the truth? The reality is that we are fed news that is filtered through a lot of people's worldviews, thought processes, and prejudices. And there was also a time when you bought something and what it said on the tin was what was inside the tin. All of the food scares of recent years have demonstrated to us amply that we are no longer that certain. And the reason we have such an intense process of auditing what we eat is because we can't, be, we can't trust anymore those who are doing that. All sorts of complications here. I want us to take a, a few moments just to look back. Last year, 2014, was the 100th anniversary of something called the Christmas Truce. How many of you have heard about this? 1914, Christmas Eve, suddenly people... Men, young men, got out of the trenches and instead of shooting and shelling each other, they had a brief 
Christmas trees. Let's have a look at this video. So a very moving story. It was true. And all along uh, the, the fault line that defined the experience of these men, then for the next four years, for that brief period, there was a Christmas truce. As people began to trust each other, no greater trust could there be an expression of than someone puts themselves in the line of fire where someone is actually their enemy. And that is an amazing expression of this quality of trust. We talk, I'll come back to that. We talked about what trust used to mean. Why does it matter so much today? There's something amazing, I think, about this quality of trust. It's a bit like the solder on a circuit board that enables the hard wiring in a circuit board to operate effectively so that the messages can be transmitted to and fro and so that that little circuit board or big board, that little chip, can operate effectively in a machine, whatever it is that it's there to do. And trust really is a bit like that, this quality of trust. When trust is present in human relationships, things begin to run much more smoothly. And something actually happens, I believe, within us, psychologically, emotionally, mentally. Uh, it's almost as though our internal circuitry really begins to function properly. Things flow smoothly. Relationships work because this thing called trust is present. And there are other beneficial effects. Because our inner circuitry, our, our internal hard wiring is operating in the way that we were created to, negative experiences like anxiety, which seems to be so much part of our experience. You know, when, when we don't trust people, when we're uncertain, when we're, we lack assurance, then all of these negative feelings and thoughts and emotions begin to emerge in our hearts and minds. And this is something which is as applicable to our personal lives as it is to business. The, the terrible thing is that so often in business, people don't think about these things. You won't find it in a management textbook saying this is really important. But it is because it's the way human beings function. And so where trust is present, it begins to push anxiety away. Imagine your own relationships, whatever they are, including the ones here at work. And this is one of the things I'd like to see happening more and more as we go into this year. High-performing organization though we are, I'd like us to move further up that ladder of excellence where the quality of our relationships begins to define our excellence in a new way and we set the bar even higher for other people. Anxiety and all those negative feelings seem to somehow be pushed away and there's a much greater level of cooperation between people on the things that really matter. But so often trust is overlooked by so many people. It's not something that people are talking about, either in the way we live or in our attitude to others or in our approach to life. It just isn't part of the way we do things around here. Forgive me for constantly talking about politicians, but they seem to define the news so much. And of course, because politicians in this country are the leaders, they are governmental leaders. They are, they are there to lead as provided by our Constitution. Therefore, the responsibility that is upon them is a very grave one. And it is absolutely vital, in my opinion, that every person who has taken the responsibility to have political office has an inner conversation and asks themselves, am I a trustworthy person? Do people trust me? And it's equally important, I believe, that the general population begins to ask that question. One of the challenges we have is we have a media that cannot itself be trusted because it's driven by sensationalist principles rather than the good of the people. Now, none of this needs to be thought of as being utopian. None of it needs to be. If there is enough fire in our bellies, enough passion in our hearts, enough drive in our minds, we can say enough is enough. We want to draw the line and say the past is the past. We want a new future. 
Some of you have children. Some of you have grandchildren. What kind of future do you want? We want people to start paying more attention. This is the kind of stuff we want to be talking about in pubs and in letters pages to editors in local press and to the BBC and to the other television channels. See, life's journey can be really lonely. But it does not have to be walked alone. That's the incredible, amazing, wonderful, life-giving quality of trust. It can enable us to experience something in ourselves that when we begin to trust others, that our inner hardwiring gets an amazing boost. Something happens within us. And I'm sure neuroscientists will over the next few years be able to identify exactly what is going on uh, in our neurons and synapses in our brains that create this generally positive outlook on life. And other great things happen. Hopefulness somehow is generated as is optimism. Think about it. It sounds like it's logical and easy to work out, but we don't talk about it. But that's what happens when people are trusting one another, when there's cooperation, when there's openness, when there's transparency, which is what we try to encourage in our business and among our boards and in our relationships with all our partners. That's a more of a struggle sometimes, of course. But wasn't it a struggle? for the people who were on either sides in those trenches. Was that not a struggle? They were their enemies. They had been killing each other. The war had been going on for about five months. And so we try to encourage that. We want to see that more and more. So in that terrible battle, they called it the Great War, the war to end all wars. What would have happened after Christmas Eve 1914 if trust had been allowed to flourish? Instead, people were told, soldiers were told, you will be shot if you try and fraternize with the enemy again. And for four terrible years, the shelling went on. This was a terrible war, a war when people first discovered what um, metal tearing through space at a terrific velocity could do to a human being. What uh, huge noises would uh, do to someone's not just their ears, but to their mental faculties. Shell shock was something which left soldiers with terrible mm, psychological scars for the future. 37 million people became casualties of that great war. And within 20 years, the, the powers in Europe were at war again. And in that great conflict, 60 million lives were lost. And it's as though we never learn anything. But don't be dis dis discouraged. Don't be disheartened. Remember, if there's one thing about the way we do things around here, it's we say we will do what we can to make a difference. Because without trust, just as then, just today, we go to war. There's an absence of peace. There's a loss of hope. And there's uncertainty in our future. And we don't have to be going to war for this to happen. It's what happens in relationships. It happens in personal relationships. It happens in business relationships. What a struggle this business has had over its 15 years in some cases. In some situations with people who should have been our closest partners for whatever reasons we do not know. But our, our approach has always been to try and build the bridge, to build the bridge, to mend the fence, to try and create a place of trust because our objective is to make a difference in people's lives. So how should we act? Our third point. Well, clearly, you have to ask yourself, am I in the camp of people where I don't believe this is important, where I overlook it, where it, I don't give it a moment's thought? As we go through the year, we'll talk more about this. We'll talk about how what happens when trust is broken and how we get it back and how we rebuild it. But for now, as we go into this year, ask yourself, am I in that kind of place? Maybe my trust has been broken so much that it's very difficult for me to trust or to give it. That's why our way of doing things is about self-improvement, saying we want to do things. Do you want to be in that situation where you give your inner circuitry a real boost and so that your levels of hopefulness and optimism really are generated? Imagine when you live like that, you can transform people around you. Because it's true, it's, you know, it's, not, a, it's not a mask you're putting on. It's what's really going on in your life. And you can then have that kind of impact. 
So it's never too to lear- late to learn. Do not think that because you've got to a certain place in your life and uh, you know, uh, things have happened, I can't change. You can. And what better time than in January of the new year? So we've talked about reinvigorating trust and getting the boost. We're going now into this new year, and it's going to be an amazing journey of talking about trust, seeing how it works out in our lives more and more and more. But to do this, every one of us has to be prepared to make a change, to make a mental, psychological, maybe even emotional change, but a conscious decision of the will to come across the bridge from where we are, to seize our 2020 vision and to make progress along the road to renewal. And we do it by changing ourselves, and thereby we transform the world in 2015. Colleagues, friends, can we do it? Yes, we can. Thank you very much.